Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger, and we are talking about Daniel, chapter one. Uh, the book of Daniel is really great, I think, for us today in a society that is not a Christian society, living as Christians in the world. Um, I feel like there are a lot of parallels for us to see in Babylon and the commands that God gives to the people of Israel or of Judah rather as they are captive planting gardens and all that but spoilers I'm getting way ahead of us <laughs> um but anyway I'm excited that we're starting the book of Daniel which is all I was really trying to say um we're going to begin at the beginning um with chapter 1 and what Daniel does when he's faced with the possibility of eating the king's food. Why, do, why does it matter? You know, that's probably what a lot of his friends ask him. Mm -hmm. Bible teachers and pastors and commentators tend to be quick to reply, well, it was ceremonially unclean. But that seems unlikely for all of it. Does, does Nebuchadnezzar not like venison or beef or chicken? Mm -hmm. It probably was a fruit, vegetables. There was probably a great deal of food that was clean by the dietary laws that Israel observed. Others say, well, it was offered in sacrifice to idols. And that's quite probable, certainly possible. But the text doesn't mention it. And St. Paul, in his discussion of Mitzach offered to idols, does say that a, a strong believer can realize that the meat still meat and eat it without without offending God, if if we can eat in faith and, and thank God for it. And again, the text, the text simply does not say that it was offered to idols, nor draw any attention to it. The one thing that the text does say, but repeatedly and plainly, is it's the king's meat. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the distinctive about that, it. That seems to be what's distinctive about it if we just read the text as it stands. But that the kind of strikes us funny in the 21st century because we our reply is so what? <laughs> well, it none of us be... <laughs> has ever been invited to dine with a king. I mean, very few of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I haven't. We're... If you have, good for you. Nope. Not me. Uh, so we don't really. To us, food is food. You sit in a restaurant, and there are all kinds of people around you, and as long as you... And yet, we assume that the people we're, we're eating with are friends. I've been in places in Europe where you, you're you given your food, and you go and you sit down at a long table with lots of people you don't know at all. They may be mm -hmm. tourists, they may be locals, and the place is so packed, you just kind of squeeze in next to total strangers. <laughs> and even Americans have got to admit, that's a little weird. <laughs> we normally eat with people we know, people mm -hmm. we have some kind of relationship with. It may be family, maybe good friends. It may be uh, a young man buying a dinner for a young lady to work out some kind of romantic relationship. Maybe a business lunch uh, where people are trying to sort out the possibility of some future business relationship, financial commitments and all that. It is rare to sit down with someone you don't know at all and just start eating. Um, actually, it does happen. I was, a few weeks ago, I was waiting to pick up a pizza and several tables over, a gentleman who had been talking to the people behind the counter and then started addressing the room and then started talking to me. And I started talking back, and eventually I moved over and, and spoke to him more plainly because guess what? We had something in common. We were Christians. Hmm. And he was having a hard day, and he had kind of wanted to be at his church, and he ended up here because of family things. And he was so glad to meet a fellow believer, and I ended up praying for him before I left. See, even in this context, yeah, you sometimes talk to people because they're just there and proximity wins. But even today, in the 21st century, eating with somebody generally means there's some kind of relationship that exists, or you're trying to build, or that in the process of just being near each other, you discover, and then you turn chairs around and you just start talking. <laughs> in the ancient world, it was much clearer that this, this was what food was. 
uh, and particularly where royalty is involved, not everybody, you joked about it earlier, but not everybody gets to eat with a king. Uh, I never got to eat with Queen Elizabeth. I've never got to eat with any of the presidents uh, who have served during my lifetime. There are there are people who are somewhat famous within my definition of famous that I have gotten to eat with, and it's you know that's an honor. It's an honor to sit at the table with somebody who is well known, who's respected, who has some authority, to be included within that sphere of community. And in the ancient world, this was very, very true. You, not just anybody came and ate at the king's table, because the king's table was not a smorgasbord, it was really a king with a real table. And so for Daniel and his friends to be invited to share the king's meat, whether it actually meant they went to his table or it was just ferried to them by servants, it still involved an act of communion, an act of drawing close, of uh, enjoying a friendship, a relationship, a uh, patrician to plebe, lord to vassal, something where they were accepting that this is a basic, the, the basic perhaps, communion and community in our lives. Well, what's wrong with doing that? I mean, if you want a social climb, shouldn't you appreciate such a thing when the king says, come have dinner with me? It depends who the king is. And if we just uh, treat it abstractly, like, well, some old king someplace, that, that doesn't do justice to what's happening here. Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, of Babel. Babel does not have a good reputation in scripture. It goes all the way back <laughs> to Nimrod and Cush and that whole rebellion where God intervened and scattered mankind. Or they could think back to the time when Achan saw a Babylonian garment and mm -hmm. coveted it and stole it. And Israel got into a lots of trouble uh, at Ai for uh, messing with things Babylonian. Or the Babylonian ambassadors who not so far in the past had visited Hezekiah and of whom God had said, well, that's great. You showed him everything. Well, your whole um, palace full of stuff and all of your kids are going to go to Babylon. But more to the point, of course, was that Nebuchadnezzar was the king who had come against Jerusalem, who had um, see, laid siege to it, had conquered it, and now was taking people away from it to Babylon. And in fact, Daniel is one of those. Daniel has been taken by force from his community, his family, the people he knows and loves, from the worship of his God, from the temple. And he's been taken to a strange foreign land where basically they're trying to brainwash him. They're, they're doing it. They're very nice about it. They're giving him the best room, the best clothing, the best food, probably anything he wants. He just has to go to classes and learn how to be a good, right-thinking Babylonian so that one day, perhaps, he can go back to his own land and work for the Babylonians as one of them. This is the king who's making nice-nice with Daniel. And Daniel and his friends say, yeah, we're not okay with this. We, we understand that Jerusalem has fallen because of the sins of God's people. God is angry with us. This is part of his prophesied judgment. It's what the law said would happen. It's what the prophet said would happen. It is what, in fact, has happened. And we're not sure really where we stand in relationship to God. But he is our first loyalty, and we're not going to get too comfortable with basically the Antichrist. Uh, in, in the uh, perspective of an earlier generation, Hit dinner with Hitler maybe is not such a great idea, or lunch with Mussolini. And, and this seems to be where Daniel and his friends uh, run up against the wall. You give us new names, okay. You put us in new clothes, okay. You've taken us from our families and all of that. The issue of who they worship is not on the line. They are not told they have to give up their God. They're not forced to worship idols at this point. So those things aren't there. They are, they're not told, they're not, the, the, they're holy books if they've made it to Babylon, have not been taken away from them. If they can get hold of them, that's fine. They're not forbidden to go to synagogue, apparently. there's None of that's there. And so all these other things they, they're accepting or they're, they can deal with, 
But at this point, they draw the line. Daniel's obviously the leader. But these four men agree together that, yeah, we're, we're not okay with dinner with the Antichrist. So here we're going to draw a line. And back to your original question. His other friends, the other young men who were brought to Babylon, probably looked at him and said, we don't get that. There's, it, it, the, 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 we're, we're staying away from the pork and the bacon. Uh, we're not eating the sea fish, seafood stuff, the shell, crab shells and things. Uh, so we're not violating any of God's dietary laws. Hey, we're not even getting drunk. We're eating the good stuff, and uh, we are strong believers, and so the fact that it may have been offered idols, we're not asking, we're not telling, we're not complaining. We think you're just a little over-righteous here, Daniel. We don't see where you're getting this in Scripture, and it just doesn't make sense. You got to get along to get along. You have to be involved in the system to work the system. You're right now, you're alienating yourself. Um, the, the powers that be are going to look at this, and they're going to look at this as you just being troublemakers. And uh, we, on the other hand, hey, we're, we're doing well. We, go, we, get, we get invited to all the great parties and the balls and the celebrations. We talk to important people. We're going to be the movers and shakers in this empire. And give us time. Give us another 10, 20, 30 years. We're going to be running Babylon. And then look where we'll be. We'll be able to exercise dominion in the name of God and for the sake of the covenant people. And who are you? You're just going to be on the outs and no one's going to invite you to any parties. So, this is deeply ironic, given what we know about <laughs> Daniel's later life. It is. Uh, there is very heavy irony here. But that knowing human nature, that is exactly what people are saying to him. Yeah. You're a legalist. You're a pietist. This is not in scripture. There's no explicit command. And so there, we don't see a reason to do this. If you want to do it, okay. But dominion, responsibility walking the corridors of power. We're going to be doing that, and you're going to be having your, your little Bible studies with three people present. We thought you were smarter than that. Um, we, ha we have a dinner to go to. Talk to you later. <laughs> well, Daniel, first of all, just, just in passing, and, and maybe that's the problem, that it's just in passing. We know the three friends, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were not their names. <laughs> their names were... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, good Hebrew names, mm -hmm. uh, all of which have the name of God or Yahweh worked into their names. Fun fact, I met somebody swing dancing one time who was named Mishael. And mm. I was like, oh, like in the Bible. He's like, yeah, not a lot of people know that. <laughs> <laughs> I was a Bible teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just call me Shadrach. Um, <laughs> Whereas the Babylonian names seem to be rooted in the names of Babylonian gods. It's not that names are unimportant. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Daniel gets a, a new name too, Belteshazzar. But of, of all the places where they could draw a line, that's not the one they choose. Mm -hmm. and, and Call under, me anything but late for dinner almost. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Under other circumstances, perhaps they might have chosen that. And mm -hmm. sometimes what people call you does matter. But here, they were going to let that pass. They, they can't control what other people call you. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not pouty teenagers who say, if you don't call me this, I'm not answering. <laughs> Z uh, or <laughs> themselves. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, these these three young men, these Hebrew men who, as you say, most, most people, unless you're a Bible teacher and have actually paid attention, you may not even know that they have other names. Mm -hmm. Because... They're referred to, we, we always see them after this and through Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, and he always calls them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He uses the or in the vegetable them. form, Rakshak and Benny. Thank you. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, but that's again, that's more of the irony here, that even Christians have come to call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when mm -hmm. those are their pagan names given them by pagan conquerors. And they, in their humility and in their wisdom, simply smile and say, you called, mm -hmm. rather than fussing there. But they do fuss, they do draw a line where the food's concerned. Uh, and so together they, they consult and probably pray a good deal. And eventually they go to the, the man in charge, 
This is uh, chapter one of Daniel. And we're told, I'll just read a little bit here. The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the king's wine, which he drank, so nourishing them three years at the end thereof, they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of uh, Meshach, and of Azariah of Abednego. And Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, I, I don't know if he actually went to him and said, uh, we find this uh, religiously defiling. Could we have something else? <laughs> he, may, he may not have been quite that blunt, but and somehow he communicated that this that we have religious scruples here that we may or may not discuss at this point. Um, now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. So Daniel, to this point, had been a good kid, a nice young man. He's probably be about 17, give or take. Uh, and the prince of the eunuchs thinks he's a great guy and is inclined to, to do what he asks. But the prince of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your, your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? You, then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. The The... Prince of the Eunuchs, the I don't know what our equivalent would be. Uh, the head honcho here of the mm -hmm. food department uh, says, "I can't just do that because there's a there's a health issue here. If you eat, uh, he's he, the king is giving you the best food we got. It's the healthiest food. It's what it's what noble people eat. It's noble food. And if we put you on some kind of lesser diet, that's going to affect your health." And you're not going to be up to snuff when you stand before the king. And that's going to be my head, because he wants you to be healthy and strong. Um, and Daniel applies to their the guy who's actually between him and the prince, a guy named Mel Melzar, and, and, and proposes a test. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. The word pulse is, um, some people say veggies, and that's sort of true, but it's a little more exact. It means you took a whole bunch of different kinds of seeds and you ground them up. I don't know mm. what our equivalent would be. Some kind of seed meal, yeah, mealy substance. Right. It doesn't sound good to me, but... No. I don't know. <laughs> Make so, it into crackers, maybe. Right. So they're going to do that, and they're going to... And, and water. Water's safe. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, in, in their home country, they would have been taught to drink wine and to drink it mm -hmm. responsibly. Yeah. I mean, they, in the ancient world, there's often not a guarantee that the water is safe, right? That's why so yeah, many civilizations drank wine. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was healthier, by and large, mm -hmm. as long as you didn't, didn't abuse it. But that's the test that Daniel puts out there. Give us 10 days and then check us out. Now, 10 days isn't a lot for food mm -hmm. to accomplish a lot. I, was, I suppose mm -hmm. you could starve yourself a little. You might make some few cosmetic changes, but 10 days is real short. But Daniel probably figures this is the best deal I'm going to get. But the other thing here is these, these three young men know they're pushing their luck or pushing, possibly pushing the bounds of God's goodwill because they're here because Israel has sinned, Judah has sinned. They've committed idolatry. They've rebelled against the law of God and the prophets. This is God's judgment. The question becomes now, how far has God forsaken us? You can't, you, you can't say, well, God may punish the wicked in Judah, but he will always care for the righteous. They're in Babylon. They've been <laughs> taken captive. They have experienced judgment. They, yeah, they, <laughs> they've been swept up in the judgment. It, God's mercy to his elect has not kept them from experiencing the common curse that's fallen upon the land. So they don't know for certain what's going to happen. They certainly have no pledge of any kind of miracle. But they try it anyway. They they hope and trust that God will honor this in some fashion. If God's going to honor it, 10 days is as good as 20. Well, it's, it's, it's what we think we can get out of this guy, and we'll just have to see what happens. 
So back to what the text actually says, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink, then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children eat the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So give us ten days, and then you judge. And he doesn't exactly say it, but the implication is, if we, if you do not see a significant benefit to us, or at least if you see a decline in us, then we'll submit to, to your judgment. We'll, we'll eat the food. Now, if what they were doing was absolutely sinful, they would, the, the proper response would be, and if not, well, you'll have to kill us because we can't do this because it's sinful. So again, it's, this seems to be something that they've chosen as their own place to draw a line rather than a divine absolute. But in their wisdom, in their application of God's law, they're saying, we've got to draw a line someplace, and this seems like a good place to stand. But if God And they're is showing consideration for this being oh, yeah. students, as it were. <laughs> they yeah. don't want him to lose his head because of their scruples. No, they don't. And so they're, they're willing to give in. And again, it, it's easy to say, well, they were expecting a miracle. Mm. They may be hoping for one. Expecting is, <laughs> is real big. It's been a while since Judah has seen any miracles. Uh, thinking back real quickly without actually looking, which is always dangerous, we had the, the shadow and the sun, now, presumably the sun itself moving for Hezekiah. We have the slaughter of the Assyrian army in the days of Hezekiah. But I'm not remembering much in the way of miraculous intervention after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and even those are sort of oblique miracles rather than the blatant signs of Elijah and Elisha. Yeah, yeah. So they they don't know what's going to happen. I think it's very important to stress that sometimes you do walk out in faith saying, I believe that godly wisdom leads us this way. I believe this is what God wants. But under the circumstances... We cannot box God in. We cannot guarantee that God will respond to, to this, that he thinks the way we do. He may, the, the curse that hangs on Judah may be so strong that he will just say, no, too little, too late, you're on your own. Uh, I'll catch you later on my own schedule. But since they believe it's important, they are acting in faith as best they, they have. And because it's faith, faith responds to revelation. And there's limited revelation here. There's the broad principles of Scripture to which they're responding, and yet they have to wait on God to see if he will back them up, if they've got it right. And if this is the right time and the right place, and they're the right people. So back to the text. Daniel says, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and prove them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which should eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they drank and gave them pulse. I Fair. gotta say, if I were one of those students, I'd be a little bit ticked off at Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> like, I had a whole spread here. What have you done? Yeah. Uh, you don't become fairer and fatter by eating ground seeds in the normal course of things. This, this tips, I think, beyond what the Puritans would call special providence into something that's miraculous. Uh, God's normal ordering of creation just doesn't accomplish this, and certainly not on schedule uh, that, that a man himself has, has dreamed up. So the, the young men are greatly encouraged. God has backed them up. They took a stand. God is there for them. He has done something that it's quiet. It's not moving the sun in the heavens. It's not the uh, Tigris, or the, I guess it would be the Euphrates, turning to blood. Uh, it's not the sun going dark. It's our frogs multiplying. But it's, it's a miracle, and it's one they personally have experienced. So they know now this is the path. This is what we're to do. We're to maintain our testimony, our witness for Yahweh in the midst of a pagan culture, to continue to assert the creature, the creator creature distinction in the midst of a society that's dedicated to continuity of being theology, and to hold fast the God who speaks over against the idols who babble nonsense. 
we're we're going to hold to a divinely rational universe in the face of the irrational mysticism of Babylon. And so they do. And in time, they are brought before Nebuchadnezzar. And the text says, the king communed with them, and among them all, that is, all of these young men were brought in. And among them all, there was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, and in all matters of wisdom and understanding, the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. They weren't simply better than the other kids their age, the other young people their age. By now, they're probably 20. The three-year program has been finished. They've, they've graduated from Babylon U. They're better than all of the other straight-A students. They're, they're, they are able to think with a wisdom that these other Jewish young men don't have. But more than that, they are wiser and more helpful than the old guys the stargazers, the astrologers, the magicians, who have been standing before Nebuchadnezzar all of his very short reign, because he hasn't been king very long, and during all of his father's reign before him. These are these seem to be four of the smartest guys you're ever going to meet anywhere, because their answers are not, not only make sense, they practically work. They're, they're things you can get a hold of and do something with. For instance, if... Uh, the Babel, the Euphrates is lacking water. The mages might go on and on about how the great goat of heaven has not been milked properly by the <laughs> goddess of cow of goat milking, and thus we need to sacrifice frogs in order to stimulate the. Pro you, know, you go. You can imagine how magic works here, because that's the system they were working with. Continuity of being means as below, so above, we have the magic powers here to move the universe. And the magic things that we have to do are rituals. They involve uh, icons and talisman and, and rites and rituals that make absolutely no sense except to a magician. And they make sense only to a magician because, and that's the way we've always done it, because that's what the gods, the powers that be want. And this will indeed move the universe. Whereas Daniel and his friends are more likely to say, there was not much rainfall in the mountains. Notice the <laughs> snow caps are not so hot. Our suggestion is rather let let the let the frogs live and let's build more cisterns and let's start an irrigation system and let's dam up some of the streams and let's get some water going that we can make use of during these dry years. It's going to be something like something like oh what Joseph did when he was in Egypt. They would come up with practical advice that fit a rational universe. Not that they're rationalists, but that they believe in a consistent, faithful, covenant-keeping God who operates this universe consistently as he promised Noah he would do. Mm -hmm. And on that basis, they ignore all the magic garbage, and they move directly to engineering and physics and meteorology. <laughs> and, and, and lo and behold, it works. The magicians may be out there sacrificing frogs, while Daniel and his friends are arranging for the damming up of some moderately sized stream. And within a few days, it's very clear the frogs are just sitting there shedding goo all over, but water's already filling up in this new reservoir. And the people can see, whoa, we're going to have some water over here pretty soon. This is good. And, and that's the kind of practical things that were going on in questions of human nature. They would know Proverbs. They would know the Psalms. They would know Job and the wisdom literature, Ecclesiastes. They would know the law of God. They would know how to think properly about fallen man and what he's capable of uh, and how much he's not to be trusted. They could see through all kinds of scams and schemes and failures and excuses. They could also tell the king, yeah, you're trying to change people's hearts there. You can't do that. So you can kill them. Or you can bribe them, but you don't have the power to make them think differently. So, and education in the long run is not going to do that the way you think it is. So let's consider, how about free trade? That might do a whole lot more good here than what you're talking about. And so on. Their, their understanding of the law of God, of God's providence, of man's sinful nature, 
would give them a tremendous advantage in that community. We can think here of David in the Psalms saying, I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy commandments. Uh, this, this is what these young men, at, at about 20, would. this is the kind of advice that we were doing and the kind of advice that Nebuchadnezzar approved of. And as you said earlier, the irony here is that this is the last time we ever hear of all the other young princes of Judah. They just, they vanish. Presumably, they went someplace and did something. Probably got some low-level government jobs. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they were consigned to bureaucratic service somewhere, one, one assumes. But Daniel and his friends had the ear of the king, and as time goes on, they climb the ladder even further, and they climb every time by standing up to the king's wickedness and idolatry. Every point they're exalted is because they challenged the king. And he didn't always like being challenged. But when God backed them up, the king would back up and say, oh, well now, um, God's on your side. We can use this. <laughs> I can tap divine resources because my magicians sure aren't doing it in any convincing <laughs> way. Uh, and, and we'll see that in the next chapter, which I assume will be our, our next program, that when the king gives the command to go kill all the wise men, Daniel is able to go right into him to ask for an audience. He's granted the audience and says, I can answer your question. Just give us some time. And Nebuchadnezzar hears him. He's, he's frustrated with all the old guys, all the guys with the PhDs and the, uh, the, uh, who've earned the mantles of this God or that God. He's, he's, he's had it with them. They're, they're worthless. But when Daniel steps in, he is at least willing to listen and give him a chance. And, and by this point, Daniel is still really young. To some of our readers, 20, 21, 22 may sound kind of old. I'm sorry. It really <laughs> it's isn't. Quite young. <laughs> it's quite young. The chapter ends with, with one note that I, I didn't read yet. It says, Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. What that means, now we don't run into Cyrus until much later in the book. Uh, but what it means is Daniel survives during the whole length of the Neo-Babylonian Empire, from the time that Nebuchadnezzar ascends the throne, through his reign, through the quick reign of a few of his successors, through Nabonidus and Belshazzar's uh, reign together. Daniel's there, and he, and when Babylon falls, Daniel doesn't. Mm -hmm. Daniel survives. He outlived the Babylonian Empire. He outlived his captors. And when Cyrus comes, he is put in charge of the kingdom. So here is this young man who, very early age, with not no resources, no backing, no adults to run to and say, please help, no sweet old ladies you can go to and say, please pray for me, I, this is going to be tough. He and his friends are on their own, as far as they can see. All they have is their walk with God. And it's enough. Because they commit to being faithful. At a very basic level, they're not going to compromise. Who they eat with, who their friends are, who the, what gang they belong to <laughs> is what's going to define their existence. And the center of their gang is the God of Israel. They're, they're mm -hmm. going to be in his gang, whatever it costs them. And, and, there's, and again, they have no guarantees at this point that this is going to be an easy battle or an easy ride, but they're not going to back down. They're not going to quit. They're not going to compromise. They're going to trust God for the results, whatever those results may be. If they die, then praise God. And of course, in the next chapter, we're going to see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego use this line exactly. Um, it's uh, the God we serve. He can rescue us. But if he doesn't, we're, not, we're still not bound down to your stinking idol. It's that clear. Uh, we're, we're on God's side. We're standing with him. We're eating with him. We're having our communion with him. And um, that doesn't mean we're your enemy, Nebuchadnezzar. We're actually here to help you. But it's going to be on God's terms and not yours. So think twice here, please. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the book, we see, we, we only see his friends a little bit longer. And then they drop out of the scene, perhaps transferred else place. We don't know. By the time we get to the, the story that everybody knows, Daniel in the lion's den, 70 years have passed depending on how you reckon it. 
And Daniel is no longer one of the many reasons I hate Bible storybooks. <laughs> you you see the pictures, and you see Daniel as a teenager being thrown to the lions. That's the end of the story. That's when Babylon has had its seventy year run and has fallen, and there's a new king in town, Cyrus the Persian. He's the one who throws, and he's called Darius in the book of Daniel. He's the one who throws Daniel to the lions, and Daniel survives. And Daniel, at that point, is in his, well, late 80s. Mm -hmm. yeah, and same with Moses yeah. and the Exodus, right? There's right, something Moses. to this. <laughs> yeah, God, well, God waits a while for you God, to be ready God for your thing. God <laughs> sometimes waits a while, and we get really impatient. We want to change the world now, which is not in itself a bad thing. No. But we, we do need to realize that it may not be God's thing. God may not start working for a very long time. Yeah, it's interesting. In the New Testament, we have Paul telling, is it Timothy, let no one despise your youth? Yeah. And yet, the people he generally puts in his church are elders. Yeah. <laughs> They're not called smart people. They're called elders. <laughs> Nor are they called youngsters. Right. Everyone submit to the youngsters in your church. No. Uh, it's, no. <laughs> it's not, we're not doing that. So the faith that survives the lion's den is the faith that begins in youth. It takes time and trial and practice and resting on God and waiting on God and enduring all sorts of things. Because when it comes here, we, we we kind of see the soul searching that Daniel has to go through. When we come to the lion's den story, Daniel hears, oh, so that's what you're going to do. If I pray, I'm in trouble. Okay, I'm going to go pray. <laughs> and... Um, he gets thrown in the lion's den. And again, there's no there's no hint here of any great soul searching or what do I do now? I'm not sure. It's like, hmm, lions. That's interesting. Okay, throw me. <laughs> and when he and he doesn't seem terribly surprised when God rescues him either. It's this when you've lived your life with God long enough and faithfully enough, then some things just don't move you. It doesn't mean nothing will move you, but some things become a little petty. And a little, really, yeah. really, you think mm -hmm. that one's going to trip me up? No, I've been through that. I've done that. Um, it's, no, you're going to have you're gonna have to up your game if you think that you're going to. Before I deny Christ, you're going to have to come up with something a mm -hmm. lot better than that. Because I've been there and done that. Yeah, It's such a singular mindset to us today, I think. Um, often, you know, when charities change how they are run in response to changes in government policy, for instance, mm -hmm. often it's framed as, well, the government won't let us do this anymore. Yeah. Whereas really it's the government will not give you free money if you don't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like on an organizational level, that's often what's yeah. going on behind the scenes. And so it's the the power of the purse that's making the difference there. And then on an individual level, it's, well, the government told me I couldn't do X. So mm -hmm. I'm going to obey the government. Well, no, the government can't really stop you from doing X. They can just respond to your doing X. Exactly. And are you willing <laughs> to take that response? Yeah. It's it's like, you know, as we're telling Gretchen these days, if you do this, you will get a spanking, you know. <laughs> I don't know if we should uh, change that to sandwiches for the sake of the internet. <laughs> if you do this, you will happens. get a sandwich. <laughs> yeah, so let's see what happens. <laughs> But no, we are not going to change how we speak of Christian life just because someone may be listening and censoring what we're doing. Yeah. That we doesn't don't mean need we're to self-censor, I guess. No, we're not going to self-censor. We're not going to be stupid. Right. But there are some things that will say them the way the Bible says them, and people can do what they want with that. There, there's a time to use oh. euphemisms and um, watered-down speech, but not often. And when you are talking about what the Bible itself actually says, I think there's a danger there. I think that's the mm -hmm. very kind of thing that Daniel and his friends are running away from. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then there are those things that we have adopted this policy because we believe it is favorable to the kingdom of God, but it is not something God requires of us. You know, you can bend on those things. You can say, all right, well, we, for instance, as a Christian school, we start our Christian school with this sort of vision. There's nothing in the Bible that says our vision has to be exactly like this. Uh, in fact, the Bible doesn't even exactly say that there must be Christian schools, although I think it rather implies it more than once. But um, 
you don't, it doesn't say you have to have this kind of curriculum or meet in these kind of facilities or work with these kind of students. And as, in, for, for instance, in our schools, we've gotten a new clientele. We've had to change some of what we do. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. We're not compromising scripture. We're just saying, oh, God in his providence is giving us a new assignment and to stubbornly cling to our old way of doing it. Yeah, that's that's wrong. And that can get us in a lot of trouble. Uh, but for someone, a, a foreign power, or uh, foreign to our jurisdiction, that is, someone, someone who does not have legitimate authority comes to us and says, uh, you have a history class. Well, you may go ahead and teach history, but uh, you must be sure to teach the millions of years of humanity involved and give uh, treat all cultures equally. Uh, you know, go down the list. No. <laughs> you want us to talk about all cultures? We do that. We tell everybody how sinful they were. <laughs> You, oh, you want us to to mention how the Greeks treated young boys? Yeah, we do actually mention that. You wouldn't like the way we talk about it, though. <laughs> um, there are times when you can meet standards by being harmless as serpents and or wise as serpents <laughs> and harmless as doves. Mm -hmm. But there are also times where you say, "No, we're not going to do that." Well, then we're going to close your school. You may. We'll see what happens then. We'll see what God does. Uh, we'll see what legal options are open to us. Mm -hmm. I appeal to Caesar, <laughs> as, <laughs> yeah. as Paul would say. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we sometimes we do draw the absolute lines in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, here, they didn't draw it on the issue of wine. They drew it on the issue of communion, which is a lot fuzzier. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't that they wouldn't drink wine at all. It was the wine we get is from the king, and he's the one. This is This is about relationship. This is about who defines our existence and what sphere of of social interaction we're going to move in and what's going to set our priorities. It's way beyond whether or not this goes through my lips or not. And and they were willing to bend on some things, but on the basic issue of where is your allegiance, that's the thing they wouldn't bend on. And that allegiance ultimately would cover everything and would test all of them. In the next chapter, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, their lives are on the line. And, and with the story of the lion's den, Daniel's lion, life is on the line. But having settled this here, now, those later contests weren't what they could have been otherwise. When we compromise and compromise and compromise, and then a huge compromise comes up, it's a lot harder to say no. It's a lot harder to stand firm for Christ when we've already slipped so many times. That doesn't mean you can't. It just is more difficult, mm -hmm. you know, psychologically, spiritually. Uh, and yeah, no, it's embarrassing. Well, yeah, I should have stood for Christ all those times and didn't, but I'm going to now. Okay, well, that's good now. Um, <laughs> it, you would find it easier, and we'd probably have be having fewer discussions if you'd started early. So to young people listening, your walk with Christ has already begun. Your who you who what gang you run with is is at stake here. Is Jesus your Lord? Is he your best friend? Are his people your best friends? Or are they just one small part of your life and most of your loyalties and time and allegiance lie elsewhere? This is this is what Daniel 1 is talking about. And something for you all for all of us to think hard about. Mm -hmm. That's as uh, we could go on for a long time, but we should stop and do some recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would like to recommend a liberal arts education, and I mm. have so many caveats. Well, is there a positive thing before you start doing the caveats, or do you want to do the caveats yeah. first? Well, we need to define liberal arts education okay, is really what be... the caveat is. <laughs> All right, well, let's um, go ahead and do that. Yeah, I don't mean an English degree. Although an English degree is a fine thing to have. I don't mean a history degree, although mm -hmm. obviously I think those are pretty great. I have one. But what I mean is education for the sake of the learning community, not for the job you expect to get at the end of it. Mm. I think it's a wonderful thing. It is a luxury. And I don't think everybody needs it. I think trade schools are probably more practical if you're thinking, hmm, I've just finished high school. How do I go out and 
make my way in the world. Probably consider trade school first. But if you've got extra time and can get scholarships or, I don't know, you're rolling in money or something, consider taking a few years to just learn and be a part of a community that's about learning, um, especially one that's about learning about Christ. Mm-hmm. And that that means not just classes. It means not just the books you read. It means who you eat with. Um, I look back on my college experience and eating with friends, that's, that's where the learning really hits. It's not in class, although wonderful things happen in class, but it's really bringing it into your life and into your relationships. You, you speak of a learning community, and, and to some people, that's a very strange thing, especially with these last several years where so many classes are online. And even before that, we've had, from our school, we've had students who've wanted to take online classes. Now, there's a time and place for this, obviously. Yeah, there's lots, lots, a lot of ways to get from point A to point B. And a lot depends upon what you're after. If, if you're after the skills mm-hmm. that will enable you to pursue a calling, then any way to get you there probably is going to be okay, as long as it doesn't violate God's law someplace along the line. Yeah. If you want to make contacts with people, though, if you want to begin networking, that kind of involves, as you say, sitting down and eating with some people, having pizza late at night as you go over notes with friends and things like that, or at least sitting beside someone in a classroom Mm -hmm. and uh, talking over what you think is going to be on the next test. It also involves, in many cases, finding a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And 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 becoming friends with that teacher on some level. Now, yeah. some teachers won't let you, <laughs> largely because they're jerks and full of mm-hmm. themselves. But good teachers are always willing to talk to you and begin relationships. Because the reason we get into this gig is to help young people grow up to, and then the question is, to what? If you're a Christian you have one set of answers. If you're not, you have a different set of answers, although sometimes they superficially look at like at first. But teachers at some level want the best of their students. And depending on the background and the faith, the worldview of the teacher, even if he's not a Christian, there may be still good things, even from a Christian perspective, where you can say, mm-hmm. yeah, well, he doesn't he doesn't exactly understand what I'm all about, but he's willing to write me the... Um, letter of recommendation for me with asterisk and and smiley faces. I mean, this guy thinks I'm great. (laughs) I'll go with that. This guy has showed me um, processes in mathematics or the sciences or in culinary school or in computer sci that that none of my Christian teachers ever knew about. I am learning stuff that has practical stuff here because, as, as in Daniel's case, I've been brought into tender love with this guy or this lady or whoever. Mm-hmm. So those and that's are kind nothing of, inappropriate. That's the tenderheartedness yeah. of a teacher yeah. in wanting the best for your students. And it's there's no guarantee that you're going to get that mm-hmm. in any given school. I was greatly blessed in my junior college. Most of my teachers were like that. There were one or two that weren't or that were simply very poor teachers. But by and large, the guys who taught me were great. And they were more than willing to, to talk to you about whatever uh, when, when they had some downtime or in, just before class or just after class. And I was right in the middle of class because they were really good at what they did. Because the reason they were in a junior college is because they wanted to teach. They didn't want to do research. They wanted to work with people. Mm-hmm. And, and so this is something that can present great opportunities for learning. Um, now, I learned theology and a good deal of history, and certainly what literary theory I know, from books. And I learned well because I read a lot of books, and I read from a lot of directions. I read, I, I read from people who quoted each other and who quoted the same confessions and creeds. But that God was gracious to me. That doesn't always work. And most people do need uh, pastors and uh, Christian leaders who will interact with them. Not that you didn't need a pastor. <laughs> no, I had a pastor, but you know, he was busy, and we I did <laughs> bend his ear a few times. But a lot of the learning I did, I got from reading books. And so I'm, I'm sensitive. That is a way to mm-hmm. learn. Yes, But absolutely. I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. Mm-hmm. What I did learn, and people are sometimes surprised to find out I was a physics major. 
<laughs> um, in fact, sometimes very surprising. Well, here's this book on physics you should read. Did you know I was a physics major? I uh, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I chose physics in part because I figured that I, I I loved history already. I loved theology and philosophy. I was learning to love literature, and I figured these these are things I can learn on my own by reading. I'm never going to teach myself calculus. I'm never going to teach myself physics and chemistry. And so I deliberately enrolled in those programs to find people who knew this stuff and who could teach me uh, better than I could ever teach myself. And particularly at the junior college level, uh, I was extremely successful. God was very gracious. So as we're talking about this idea of an educational community, it's not the only way to learn. But it's a really good way to learn certain sorts of things and to have certain sort of experiences that rarely can be duplicated by other means. Mm -hmm. And a question again becomes, well, what is your goal? Do you need the skills real fast? Some people just need the degree. They need the the, the, the ticket. The piece of paper. The yeah. piece of paper. And they know that. Like, mm -hmm. I don't care about what I'm learning here. I'll learn other stuff other ways. I just need this piece of paper. Okay, for, the, mm -hmm. for you, then maybe pushing through an online school is the best thing possible. You're in the middle of a pandemic. Online school may be the only option you have. Mm -hmm. And so we're not setting hard and fast do's and don'ts here, but we're, we're talking about I'm making wisdom. a recommendation. <laughs> yeah, we're making a recommendation, which I fully yeah. agree with. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, this just came up in school the other day. And I said, well, the reason we are recommending at our school a liberal arts education is because you're too young to know what you're good at. Mm -hmm. You're too young to know how God has gifted you until you are exposed to a great many ways of thinking and doing, science, math, art, music. You don't know what's there that's untapped. You don't know what you may find that you just absolutely fall in love with. Mm -hmm. And and since all knowledge is interrelated, even if you find out, well, no, I am going to be a physicist, you may suddenly discover, oh, you mean that's related to math and to music? What? <laughs> uh, yeah. One of my characters in the novel I'm working on turns to a friend and says, but music, you're, you're all science and math and stuff. How, how do you know about... No, but 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 music is mathematically based, and they have a little discussion. <laughs> well, music is more than math, to be sure. But you begin to discover connections, and you begin to understand more of this wide, wonderful universe God has made. Mm -hmm. So, yes, liberal arts education is a wonderful thing. It's not for everybody under all circumstances mm -hmm. for lots of reasons. And it might not look like college. And it may not look like college either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it may it may come in other forms. So. Good recommendation. Thank you. And I'm going to cheat by <laughs> saying that's my recommendation no. too for all the reasons that I just <laughs> stated. With this edition, we often think of liberal arts as the humanities. Right. Incorrect. <laughs> no. Liberal arts traditionally included math and science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the original, I don't know if I can quote them off the top of my head, but the seven original liberal arts, let's see. Uh, aside from the trivium, which was what grammar, um, dialectic, logic, uh, and rhetoric, the others were astronomy, arithmetic, music, geometry. I believe that's I correct. But of yeah. course, all of those didn't mean exactly what they mean today. Right. To study ast astrology, astronomy was cosmology and science in its broadest terms. Uh, it would include um, geography and 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 navigating by the stars and all sorts of things. Mathematics would involve everything from finance and uh, counting your stock and doing taxes to the highest forms of mathematics that were available in the late Middle Ages, which at that point was largely algebra. Um, and um, the the earlier forms, the so-called trivium, was all about reading and writing, which meant you had to read something. And the answer, what do I read? everything. <laughs> but the first thing you read is the Bible. Mm -hmm. And you said everything in terms of that. The and, queen and of the sciences. The theology. queen of the sciences, yeah. theology. So when in recommending this again, we're not saying um, starry-eyed study of old books and old ideas. We're talking about understanding cutting-edge learning across, all the way across the board mm -hmm. to see what, what there is to know, what you enjoy knowing, and how it can all be put together to serve the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And at the heart of it, always, always, always read the Bible, know God. Mm -hmm. So my recommendation too. Yeah.
And come down out of that ivory tower once you've looked around inside <laughs> it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Greg. This has been a lovely conversation. Um, thank you also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Um, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. As always, if you'd like to get in touch with us, please don't hesitate to send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thank you.